the West. Big sky country. Vast open expanses. Rugged terrain. And the one animal that really drives the imagination of the outdoorsman. The mule deer. When I came out west and I saw the mule deer in these wide open spaces that just really sunk in and grabbed a hold of me. And I just fell in love with mule deer. That when you see a big old mule deer buck that's 30 inches plus, it just takes your breath away. And it's just a, a magical animal. But it is this majestic animal facing its last stand. It's the only North American big game species whose numbers have been in decline. Loss of habitat, increased development of houses and roads, energy development, increased number of predators. There's no one reason why mule deer decline. Join me, Tim Abel, as we look at the uphill battle that the mule deer faces and the wildlife professionals, the volunteers, and the hunters who are all working together to save the icon of the West. Come and help us help preserve and protect the most beautiful animal out there. Having grown up hunting white-tailed deer all my life, there's nothing that I like more than hunting mule deer in the vast expanses of the West. The incredible landscapes that a mule deer inhabits makes for a very challenging hunt. And because the mule deer's behavior is so different than that of a whitetail, it requires an entirely different strategy. What the whitetail is to the eastern U.S., the mule deer is to the West. And it is such a regal, striking animal those tall, tall horns that just seem to go forever and then the spread, my gosh, they get as much as 40 inches wide. And everybody, it's the holy grail, I guess, for a mule deer is a 30 inch. And I still haven't gotten my 30 incher. But you don't have to get 30 to be impressed with a mule deer buck. 24, 25 inch buck with a lot of mass, oh man, that's anybody's trophy. The animal's not coming to you. You're going after the animal and it, 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 it puts you in a whole different mindset and it's a different paradigm of hunting in my opinion to actually physically go one-on-one -on -one like a chess game. Sometimes that chess game will go on for a few days. Sometimes for a guy like me, it goes on for the whole season. It's, it's an adrenaline rush like no other type of hunting that I've ever come across in my lifetime. Some people call it the poor man's sheep hunt. It's more about the areas that you hunt and the style of hunting that you do. It seems like the mule deer have so much more character to them. You know, they got a drop tine or a cheater, extra brow tine, and they're all different. It's just, um a magical animal in my opinion, a, not necessarily just to hunt, but to photograph, to do anything with a, with a mule deer. It's awe-inspiring to me to see a mule deer out in their native habitat. The range of the mule deer will take you all the way from northern Canada, south into Mexico, and extends as far east as Kansas. From the valley floors of the desert to the alpine basins, you know, you, you can get a, such a wide variety of God's country, if you will, by hunting mule deer. In the West, when you're mule deer hunting, you're up high and with optics, you're able to look over long distances and you get to see a lot of things happening. You can watch deer for a long period of time and see what they're feeding on. Uh, whether you're, you're skillful enough to stalk close enough for a shot, that's a different story. It's just the experience of the West and being out there in places that look not much different than they did 200 years ago. You can get a mule deer track in front of you and follow him into some of the most beautiful country you'll ever imagine. Just make sure you can get back out. Well, what exactly are the characteristics that make a mule deer a mule deer? Obviously, the, the ears, the mule-shaped ears that a mule deer gets its name from. Mule deer have more of a cylindrical rope-like tail, which is white with a black tip whereas white-tailed deer have a, a larger flag, which is where they get their name from. A white-tail will actually run and a mule deer will stop, which is more of a, a bouncing technique. And that's something that they do to evade predators that's different than whitetail. So the whitetail antlers have a main beam that comes out of the skull and sweeps out and around towards the front, and then all of the tines arise individually from that main beam. Whereas a mule deer antlers fork, and then each one of those forks uh, split again. Another major difference between a mule deer and a whitetail is the scoring terminology. Western count, we call it a four point. Back east, they'd call it a 10 point. For scoring purposes, a lot of gentlemen refer to the tines as the G1 is the eye guard, the G2, 
the G3, this is the G4, and then the main beam. They measure that clear from the burr all the way up to the tip. And then you get four mass measurements, the H1, the H2, the H3, and the H4. And couple those side to side with an inside spread, and that's how you get the gross score of the mule deer. And then if it's not symmetrical, those are deductions. This G3 on this side is shorter than the G3 on this side, and you subtract the difference. But as any hunter knows, the real trophy is the shared experience with family, friends, and other hunters in the field. And even though I've taken a 210 net typical mule deer, my favorite experiences are still guiding. I know that's hard to believe because he's a huge deer, a trophy-sized deer, but I really enjoy taking other people, and so my favorite experiences are guiding. At the time, we think that trying to find a deer is the most important thing that we're doing that day, but in retrospect, when you think back of all the hours that you spend out in the field, you realize that trying to find a deer really wasn't the most important thing that was going on out there. You're out there talking about what's going on in your son's life, and your, your son is hearing stories from his grandfather about the pranks that they pulled in, in high school football, and, and there's, there's very few activities where a family gets together where they really spend that much time just talking. My dad starting me hunting and instilling that love of the outdoors in, in me is what got me to be a wildlife biologist and try to do good things to promote hunting and mule deer for the future. The passion is in mule deer because that's what these people grew up with and that's what they love. The future of mule deer is dependent upon this passion surviving. Sadly, these experiences may be vanishing as mule deer face declining numbers. We'll take a look at some of the reasons why and what's being done about it when mule deer, saving the icon of the West, returns. Mule deer, saving the icon of the West is brought to you by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Mule Deer Foundation, www.muledeer.org. So I'm heading up to Colorado for a mule deer hunt, a trophy mule deer hunt I'm very excited about. And as I'm driving, it reminds me that this is one of the major factors on mule deer populations and numbers, not hunting, but driving. Each year, two to three times the number of mule deer that are harvested are killed in highway collisions. And it not only has a devastating impact on mule deer numbers, but it also causes injury and death to humans. And get this, it causes over $1 billion a year in damages on the highway. The impacts from automobiles are huge. They also affect does, fawns, all age classes, where hunters mostly take bucks. Last year, they did a road study on Highway 89, and we lost 785 deer on the highway. We only hunt 200 animals in that unit. We're often asked about the issues that face mule deer. We have more people driving faster on more roads than we ever have in our history. That creates a need. How do we get the animals from one side to the other? Underpasses. It protects motorists from the wildlife and wildlife from the motorists. This is an overpass on Highway 6 in Spanish Fork Canyon. We've got trail cams underneath it that are, that are showing wildlife using it, so we feel that it's productive. We've got a large mountain range to the north and a huge winter range out to our south. So the animals the summer up north have to cross this highway corridor to get to their winter range, especially with deer movements being greatest at the early hours of the day and the late hours of the evening. It became very difficult for motorists to see those deer. So the Wyoming Department of Transportation put in a really great project here in Nugget Canyon where they did 13 miles of deer-proof fence along the highway and also add seven underpass structures. And it's done wonders for the mule deer herd here. And in the fall of 2010, we had over 13,000 mule deer use these underpasses on their migration to winter range. It's not just a wildlife issue. It's a safety and public safety issue as well, due to the success rate of getting wildlife across safely and motorists down the road safely. The key factor in the success of these highway crossings is placing them in the natural migration paths of mule deer, and then ensuring that they use them. 
You see the high fences along our freeways, those are to keep deer safe by keeping them off the freeways. From time to time, deer are very creative animals and they'll find a way out onto the freeway. Once they're out there, we need to have a way to get them off. We've come up with a wildlife escape ramp made of wood and dirt. To a deer from the other side, it looks like a logical solution to get off the freeway because it is made of natural substances. It's very simple to construct, very cost effective, and it's a good way for volunteers to get involved and, and help out in, in helping wildlife. As I leave the highway system behind and get closer to my hunting location near Golden, Colorado, the signs are good that we'll be seeing a lot of mule deer. It's a real treat for me to hunt with Tom Buhnen. Here's a guy who hunted for food as a kid. His dad taught him how to hunt and has been hunting all the way forward and taught his two boys to hunt and teaching his grandchildren how to hunt. The cool thing about Tom is he holds all these records for animals taken with bow and with rifle that he doesn't really talk about too much, but uh, you know, it's kind of cool to be out here with this guy and who knows his business out here, especially with mule deer. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to some high points and take a look at the uh, surrounding area. There was a couple bucks up here yesterday morning and uh, we haven't found them yet. This, uh, one of them is a really nice 175, 180 bucks. So hopefully we can get a shot at him. Well, I've been on mule deer hunts where I've been on horseback, and you know, 100 years ago, that was the way that you had to go up into these mountains to go after these animals. Today, we have options, and one of those options is Tom's nano boat. We used that to actually get up because some of the snow got so deep we couldn't actually walk through it without snowshoes, and I didn't bring my snowshoes, so we used that nano buggy to get to some inaccessible places and to park it and then to, to hoof it for the rest of the way and glass certain areas. But I'll tell you what, that was, uh, that was a pretty cool little deal. Yeah, this, this is a deer rub right here. Yeah. Yeah, look look at that. Yeah, it's in here. <laughs> Can you yeah. tell the size of him just by yeah. the location? Where well, he's a pretty good sized deer, really. I mean, you know, deer about that tall at the shoulder, you know. That's a nice rub, to good to see, you know. Nice, I bet he's a nice shooter buck. <laughs> I hope we see him. We were seeing a lot of animals and got real close to a lot of animals too and just not quite what we're looking for. So hopefully we'll, we'll make it happen here pretty soon. With a promising first encounter under our belts, we're gonna be heading to higher ground to see if we can spot a bigger buck. But the fact of the matter is with the mule deer numbers in decline, finding a bigger buck becomes harder and harder. We're putting in the hours glassing these big landscapes, looking for that trophy buck. But as beautiful and untouched as this and many other landscapes look to us, to a mule deer, we're looking less and less habitable every day. We build all these houses right in here where the mule deer live, and it's great for a lot of people and it's bad for our mule deer. Just uh, last 20 years in areas that I've hunted for years, there's houses all over. You get all these animals congregating on fewer and fewer acreage with fewer and fewer food supplies in which to survive. They're living in men's backyards. The Wasatch Front right here used to hold 150,000 deer, and today it couldn't winter 25,000 because we built homes in its range. As you're driving through the Southwest, you see some great desert mule deer habitat like this but not far away is a development that because of economic reasons fell through. And so what we have is mule deer habitat bladed flat. It's no use to mule deer and yet no development to benefit humans. We're left with a wasteland. As we talk about winter range, if you, if you look over my left shoulder, you know, we're losing it at an alarming rate. You can see how close town is to the foothills here. And that's why we need to make what winter range we have very nutritious and sustainable 
when the deer arrive because it's, it's becoming quite limited. The more responsible developers will leave large green areas like this wash behind me, and that's great for, for wildlife. Mule deer, however, need wide open spaces, and they're used to being in the open rangeland. It's important that, that developers are aware of what habitat needs mule deer have so they can build that into new developments. But it's also important for the public to know what mule deer need in, in, in order to advocate for that in new developments when they're buying a house. Everybody wants to become closer to nature, but it's getting closer to nature and still preserving some of that nature that's worth getting close to that makes it difficult. Say, Tim, let's take our time and let's look right over through here. Okay. Let's, uh, the deer are laying down right now. And they're gonna probably look for them under trees and look for them underneath rock outcropping. Okay. That big rock outcropping, there's a big buck that always hangs. He's kind of he's got his own bed right up there. And just going right there in the yeah. middle of the field there on the yeah. side of the hill. Yeah. I tell you, every time I go out, I'm always challenged that ability to glass a mountainside with the sun shining on it with trees and rock croppings and having him go look there's a nice buck not a shooter but a nice buck and then taking me 10 minutes to find that one buck you know after he even points out to where he is it's that eye you know where you have to get that uh, used to seeing and spotting that buck and you you were saying earlier about the difference between white tail and uh, muleys is that uh, the mule deer very rarely will have more than one? Well, they have very rarely, especially with the, with our drought slightly, and a lot of water has a lot to, to do with it too. It's, we've been in the dry spells here in, out west, and um, it's just Mother Nature's way to cut back the populations when things are tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, hopefully we can get some more moisture. This, this snow right we've got right now is a godsend right now. Well, one thing that really makes this area really good, they actually deer have it all. They have, first of all, they have the habitat, and number one is the cover. They have the food, and they have, they have water here, too. Mule deer live in such unforgiving territory that any change to that environment and habitat can be devastating. And unfortunately, much of the western habitat is under attack from invasive plant species like cheatgrass. When we have a native system, it's going to look like this here behind me, where you have a healthy sagebrush stand and you have native grass species and forb species. Over on the other side of this draw, we've got a hillside that's completely covered in cheatgrass. Cheatgrass can be such a problem because it's so prolific. Some of the infestations of cheatgrass are literally hundreds of thousands of acres. The biggest problem with cheatgrass is there's no way to eradicate it. In the past, we've been able to use prescribed fire to treat mule deer habitat. And that, by using that fire, we can come through and rejuvenate the sagebrush stand. And if we have cheatgrass in an area, we can't use prescribed fire. All we'll do is proliferate cheatgrass and eliminate sagebrush. And sagebrush provides a really valuable browse forage for mule deer. They'll eat these really high protein leaves on a sagebrush. Especially in the winter time, that sticks up above the snow. If that wildfire comes in caused by the cheatgrass, we're gonna lose that sagebrush component and we're gonna lose mule deer winter range. When the winter storms and snows come, that winter range is so important to the recovery of mule deer populations. Why is winter range such a big deal? Well, when the snow gets deep up high and the, and the deer head to the valley floors, if you don't have something for them to eat that can sustain their, their bodies through several months of very cold temperatures, generally the outcome's not very good. On a hard winter in western Wyoming, we'll typically lose 80% of our fawns, the, the deer that were just born that summer. And it's not that uncommon for 20% of our adult deer to die in a severe winter. To give mule deer a fighting chance to survive the winter, wildlife agencies are working with folks like the Mule Deer Foundation, who are working to help improve the shrinking winter habitat. So the project here was to try to reintroduce browse back into the back into the system for specifically for mule deer. What you're looking at here is a, a sagebrush plant that we that we put in the ground in April. 
uh, very valuable staples of a mule deer's diet in the winter. A lot of deer, you know, winter in this area. Uh, we're trying to enhance what's, what's available for them in regards to feed when they get here. When we have good volunteers from Mule Deer Foundation who can turn out 30 or 40 folks, um, you can make a big job small. We spent a weekend on this hillside uh, planting bitter brush and service berry and sagebrush for mule deer in the wintertime. There are things that you can do. The thought of the day as we were carrying plants up the hill is that every potted plant we carried could have been the difference between a mule deer making it through the winter and not. This is the bitter brush that came from seedlings this year. And you can see they're, they're only a couple of inches tall. Bitter brush is a very slow growing plant. These plants here were, were uh, planted 15 years ago. That's kind of a minimum amount of time that it takes to get these above snow level to where they become useful to the deer. It's an investment in the future. I think that's what we do is, you know, in the fundraising business and, and as an organization, is we're, we're banking on doing the right thing. To see it come into where we've got deer everywhere. Now if I could spread this from here to there to there to there, we'll be back in the deer business. Coming up, We'll look at some mule deer success stories and ways to bring back bigger numbers and bigger bucks. Mule Deer, Saving the Icon of the West is brought to you by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Mule Deer Foundation, www.muledeer.org. There's nothing that revives the spirit, like being on a hunt, or being out in the outdoors, or being part of the solution and the conservation of this great land so that it can be enjoyed by everyone for generations to come. I am a firm believer in the reason that we have as much wildlife in this world that we have today in North America as the results of, of hunters. The money that they've provided for mule deer restoration and management is the reason we have mule deer, not the reason we don't have mule deer. And I don't know of any other example in our history where the people have gone to the government and said, please tax us. But hunters and fishermen did that. There are anti-hunting groups out there that would like you to believe that they're putting money into perpetuating wildlife. But really, it's a, it's a fundraising strategy. In reality, none of that money is ever hitting the ground for wildlife conservation and management with mule deer. The perception out there is that hunters are bloodthirsty, terrible people, when in fact, they're the best stewards of the land. If you're not a hunter and you like to take pictures, they're there because hunters stepped up years and years ago to put their money where their mouth was and helped initiate regulations to keep animals around so that they weren't over hunting. They bring advocacy to the table. When something threatens wildlife or wildlife habitat, we have a large force of, of grassroots concerned conservationists that can bring a lot of political clout and a lot of finances to the table. Really what the North American wildlife conservation model is about is about public ownership and public participation in the conservation of wildlife. Morning, Tom. Good morning, Med. How you doing this morning? It's chilly out here today. Nice and chilly is right. Yeah. What is it? I, my character <laughs> gate said nine below. <laughs> Ready to get out of this cold and get going, eh? Yeah, let's All do right. it. All right. Good to see you, man. You too. Yeah. It was really cold last night. We've been here for a few days, but this was by far the coldest night. And coming out here and then hoofing it through the snow and glassing the, uh, the ridges and Tom has been teaching me quite a bit about where to look for the mule deer and where they like to be, for instance, where the sun's gonna be during the morning so they can get warmed up a little bit. Well, they like that southerly face, too, because, of course, you know, it's a little bit warmer there on the southerly face. So, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to conserve air, energy now, yeah. right now. So they're gonna get into these spots where that uh, it's got a little bit of sunshine. They can overlook, the, overlook their surroundings, you know, because, you know, of course, again, there's lions around. Just like the populations of game animals like whitetail, mule deer, elk, and moose need to be managed, we also need to manage the populations of predators for the carrying capacity as well. Throughout most of mule deer range, they have two primary predators, mountain lions or cougars, which take adults mainly, and also coyotes, which take a large number of fawns each year. 
The problem is, is when you get conditions where a mule deer population is suppressed, then your predator take on those herds can be a problem. And in a lot of cases, we lose a good portion of our fawn crop every year to coyotes on the fawning grounds in the summertime when nobody's out hunting coyotes. Do your part. You don't know what to do with yourself in December, grab up your varmint gun and go out and help out those mule deer. Take a few coyotes out of the population. There's definitely concern that wolves will start preying more on mule deer. At this point, they're really targeting moose and elk. Monitoring operations are an important tool used to keep track of mule deer numbers, see what factors are having a positive or negative impact, and also determine the hunting harvest numbers to meet the carrying capacity of the land. We use uh, science-based management to determine hunting seasons and we do a lot of different techniques. Specifically for mule deer, we'll use aerial surveys to determine how many of each sex and age class are in a herd. We also do a lot of looking at, at harvest data to determine how successful hunters are and what sex and age class animal they're harvesting. We do some winter mortality surveys with volunteers. We've done radio collar studies where we have volunteers that come in and help us capture animals. In dry times of the year, some of the radio telemetry studies that we've done have shown that mule deer are really not found more than a half mile, sometimes a mile from a, a water source. And so if you think about that across the landscape, you see a lot of deer habitat. Any of that deer habitat that's more than a mile from a water source is really not gonna be usable during that time of the year. We've already seen how public participation can enhance winter range for the mule deer. But what is being done to help the mule deer through times of drought? So most game and fish agencies and, and wildlife management agencies throughout the West have these water catchments and have an ongoing water development program to, to provide water for wildlife. And they build these water catchments and, and guzzlers, as they're called sometimes, to be pretty self-sufficient so that we don't have to uh, have a high maintenance but they still have to be checked once in a while. So we come in here a couple times a year, uh, make sure that the water collection devices are free of debris and, and check the water level, see if there's any cracks or any leaks in the system. And so that's what we'll, what we'll do today when we go in and check this one out. And the rainwater catchment catches rainwater as it falls throughout the year and stores it in the tank. The actual drinker that supplies the water is right around the corner here, around this bush. We try to blend it into the surroundings so it looks natural and the animals are more apt to use it. One thing unique about these guzzler projects is we're able to take advantage of our volunteers at our local chapters. They'll come out on a weekend to bring the whole family and come out and work and help construct these guzzlers and help greatly reduce the cost of, of putting this project together. We try to keep some cover nearby so the animals feel secure and they have some cover, but not too much cover that uh, ambush predators like mountain lions can, can gain an advantage when the animals come to drink. By placing these guzzlers across the winter range, it, it helps distribute the deer across the range and helps them take better advantage of the food that's available to them. Well, rainfall in the desert sometimes comes in intense thunderstorms just for short periods of time. So what these water catchments do for us is they allow us to capture those short bursts of rainfall and hold them year round to provide water for wildlife. And they're paid for by sportsmen's dollars. But they don't just benefit game species, they benefit non-game species like bats, reptiles, some of the smaller mammals as well. When mule deer saving the icon of the West returns, the passion for mule deer heads to Salt Lake City for the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. It's February in Salt Lake City, Utah. Thousands of people stream into the Salt Palace Convention Center for the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. The convention center is crammed with mind-boggling displays of outfitters from around the world, gun and apparel manufacturers, taxidermists, demonstrations, and anything that could appeal to hunters, sportsmen, and outdoor enthusiasts. But the most enthusiastic in the crowd are here for just one thing. We're only here for the mule deer. Mule deer! We're here for the mule deer. We love the mule deer. You see, this convention has a hidden purpose. Well, on the surface, it's a place for lovers of the great outdoors to find the latest and the greatest in outdoor trips, gear, and accessories. The real reason for its existence is to help the mule deer. State wildlife agencies and, and the federal agencies have had their budgets cut, and they're pulled so many different directions with all their demands for all of wildlife. 
there was really a need for some a conservation group to step in and, and help fund habitat projects, research on mule deer. Wildlife agencies have the expertise to have the background in, in what needs to be done for mule deer specifically and for wildlife, but that's really most effective when we can partner with the public and be partners in conservation to really get things done. Fueling the excitement at the Expo is the evening's big event, the Mule Deer Governor's Tag Auctions, which will raise desperately needed funds for conservation. Funds that will pay for research to try to help the mule deer. And it is help that is desperately needed. So what we want to do, folks, is dig down deep. We're going to raise money for some of the best causes in the world. One down, but now eighty, 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 now
It was cold, but I loved it. It was just a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I was just happy to have my son there, happy to have my friends there. It was fantastic. And it, and it was emotional. I'm not gonna, I have to say it was, it's an emotional experience. And I loved it, every bit of it. Although Carl's hunt's gonna be a tough on the top, right now I'm working on making my own memories. And uh, I'm hoping to put a stalk on this huge muley that we just spotted. It was uh, pretty exciting because I, when Tom gets excited about a deer, you know it must be a monster. And I like I like how he he describes them. You know, when you see that, you know it, and you don't have to guess. Well, is he a shooter or not? You just know it. And uh, man, I'm hoping that we can see a big old monster. Hoofing it through the snow, we've seen the tracks of one big monster muley. We have not seen that one big one. And we went down and tried to track him for a bit, but uh, he ended up crossing over into another another property. So we had to give up our uh, chase right there. <sighs> the muley are living in these incredible environments that are not only rich in beauty, but also rich in natural resources. And the development of those natural resources can have a major impact on mule deer. All across the West, oil and gas, solar, wind energy is exploding across the landscape. So if we want to conserve mule deer for the future, we really need to think about how we're going to develop these resources that we need. The way that we're developing the anticline allows us to, uh, to get done in a particular area, move on, and then quickly reclaim the area. And uh, we've also worked very closely with the Bureau of Land Management to develop a seed mix that enables quicker restoration of the habitat. We've learned a lot from our partnership with the wildlife management agencies and the Mule Deer Foundation, primarily how to avoid impacts to the, to the mule deer to start with. Uh, so we utilize a lot of directional drilling technology now, putting 10 and 20 and 30 wells on an individual pad so that we're not fragmenting the habitat. We've had a lot of successes working with energy development companies on mitigation and consolidation and development. And there's ways that we can do that development and extract those resources and still have mule deer. Another major factor affecting mule deer is chronic wasting disease. Chronic wasting disease will actually attack the brain and cause reduced body condition in animals and then very abnormal behavior and eventually death. There's no cure for chronic wasting disease. So right now, Wyoming and many western states have very aggressive programs for monitoring chronic wasting disease, even though it's never been shown to transfer from an animal to a human. One of the things that we do is to set up big game hunter harvest checkpoints, and we'll collect samples from hunter harvested animals to determine if they've got chronic wasting disease. Here in western Wyoming, we've been very fortunate that chronic wasting disease has never been found here. Coming up, we'll look at how the best bet for mule deer populations lies in the hands of the hunter. When mule deer, saving the icon of the West, returns. One of the most important factors in mule deer survival is passing on a respect for conservation to our children. And guess what? Hunting is a great way to do that. I try to pass it on like it was passed on to me by my dad. I, I have two daughters that, that love the outdoors and I believe appreciate it as much as I do. If we don't have hunters that are interested in mule deer and appreciate them for the future, we're not gonna have the voice speaking out for mule deer. We had a lot of people that came before us that did a lot to establish this amazing system of conservation that we have. And we're really doing them an injustice if we're not doing everything we possibly can to pass on that enthusiasm and that drive to conserve wildlife into future generations. Whether you're a hunter or not, the best thing for you to do is to get outside, get out in nature and enjoy it and pass on that experience to your kids. Hunters have their trophies to put on the wall, but for me are the images that I put in the magazines, in the calendars, in different brochures. It's to connect, then to connect with the land. 
you know, exposing your kids to the outdoors, exposing your kids to wildlife, to animals, I think animals makes better people. They, uh, they make you connect. If you can introduce a neighbor, a friend, a, a family member, a kid to the outdoors, and then they turn around and hand that same favor on to someone else, that would stop our decline in the hunting population. Well, we got one last evening to make it happen. You know, that's the way hunting is. Sometimes you find them, sometimes you don't. He's a good buck. He's a good buck. Look, oh, damn, I think he's about a 175 buck. I know, it's kind it's of a hard decision. He's right, he's right on the edge, you know? He's got my heart going, that's for sure. I know. You know, I have to say, he's a beautiful deer regardless. Oh, he is, I just, he just needs another year. If he's another year old, he'd be a monster. Once I saw that buck, you know, again, I, I go back to, I look at that buck and I go, wow. You know, if I were out here by myself, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a darn fine mule deer. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you said 185, so let's stick to that. Okay. Ah, uh, I mean, that's a beautiful deer, though, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you probably, probably kicking me in the butt? <laughs> you probably think I'm crazy, huh? Yeah. You know, one more year, yep. he's, he's there. Yep. I mean, he's 175. Well, I'm learning. All right. Uh, all right, let's, let's go lead the way. Let's go down. <laughs> Mule deer. Saving the Icon of the West is brought to you by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Mule Deer Foundation, www.muledeer.org. You know, we had a very adventurous hunt and I'm smiling because there was a deer that we saw towards the end of the last night there and um, it was about a 175 probably a little bit more maybe. That deer, man, beautiful deer. But Tom had said that we we're gonna go for 185 and above. And uh, you know, it, it, to me, that memory of seeing that deer and knowing that I could have taken the shot but didn't and chose not to as a way of, of me giving back, of me allowing that deer to go on and propagate with other mule deer so that he can spread his seed out there and so to have other great mule deer out there. That's what that was about. And uh, not that I didn't want to take the shot, but uh, you know what? It, it was the right thing to do. Well, if I didn't think the future was bright, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing with the Mule Deer Foundation. I want to be able to pass on a legacy to future generations. More mule deer, more mule deer habitat, helping to create a new generation of hunters and outdoorsmen that will enjoy the magnificent mule deer. Without our dollars spending on these animals, we wouldn't be here. We're giving these animals respect. If we're all concerned and we're all aware of what issues are affecting mule deer, we can work to try to lessen those impacts and help mule deer be a part of our national heritage in the future. We need the public to get involved in helping us get the message out to how important this habitat and this species of mule deer is. Be a volunteer. If it's something you're interested in, you enjoy being in the outdoors, if you like to fish, get with a fish group and, and help fish. If you like to hunt pheasants, get with pheasants forever and help, help pheasants. But if you're a mule deer hunter, join the Mule Deer Foundation, become a volunteer and help mule deer. Thanks for watching Mule Deer saving the icon of the West, and uh, get involved. See what you can do to help save the mule deer. Stay safe and uh, good hunting. I'm Tim Abel.